Thank you. Welcome to the um, special uh, Facilities Advisory Committee meeting uh, for February 16th, 2022. Uh, Brian Gephardt, the chair, and I call the meeting to, or to order. We will begin with the roll, roll call. Uh, please speak or raise your virtual hand if you're, if you're present as I go through the uh, list here. Uh, Ryan, myself, I am present. Uh, Cecily Lee. I, 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 you're present. Uh, Kenyana Pinzon, our surf board member. Don't see her present. Uh, Henry Fung is not present. Uh, Tom Ekman. Present. Uh, Mary Vigil. Present. Michelle Hartman Gruber. Present. Uh, Sharon Coco. Present. Uh, William Rochek. Present. Uh, Robert Ho. Do Present. You see him. Oh, there you are. There you are. Welcome. Jennifer Parker. Present. And uh, Jennifer Iochi. Yes, here present and Shachita Amalek. Yes, not here present. Oh, um, we have nine nine people present, and uh, which definitely meets our quorum. Uh, so uh, thank you and welcome. Um, we'll start with uh, adoption of the agenda. Uh, item one, is there a uh, motion to adopt the agenda or any discussion of the agenda? Can I get a motion then? I'll make a motion to approve the agenda. Sharon motions and a second. I'll second, Jennifer Parker. Thank you. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Uh, all opposed uh, say nay. Excellent. Um, moving on to moving on our next order business is introductions. Um, we ha have uh, Associate Superintendent uh, Pfeiffer here, and I don't know if you wanted to take a moment to introduce introduce yourself as a... Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to uh, introduce myself. I'm Nancy Pfeiffer. I'm the Associate Superintendent for the district. I started July 1st, and I um, just want to say thank you to every single one of you for taking this time late in the day to help us um, through a very important, very important work, our facilities. And um, so I just wanted to say thank you for, for being here tonight and the opportunity to attend the meeting. Thank you. You're welcome and we appreciate your support as well, uh, as well as Ms. McMahon's support for, and, um, and Ms. Forrest. Uh, I think I wanted to note, I believe uh, Henry Fung has just joined as well. Welcome, Henry. Hi, everyone. All right. Uh, so our next item is approval of minutes notes uh, from our February 2nd meeting. They are attached as Exhibit A um, on the, the next page of, um, after the agenda. Uh, and we're sent out, sent out in advance. Uh, is there a motion to approve the minutes from February 2nd? I will make a motion to approve, Jennifer Parker. Thank you. Uh, is there a second? I'll second Michelle Hartman Gruber. Jennifer Parker first and Michelle Hartman Gruber second. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Uh, all opposed, please say nay. Uh, the the uh, minutes are approved. We'll move to our next item, which is oral and written communications. Um, Laura or Kelly, are you aware of any written communications to 
Uh, the uh, only we only received one email from Michelle uh, regarding having the topic of bathrooms put on the agenda for this meeting. And I had responded to her that we could have a short discussion, but we will have it agendized for the March 2nd agenda since we had already finalized the agenda for this evening. Yeah. Thank you, Kelly. And thank you, Michelle. Uh, are there any other oral communications at this time? Yeah. Seeing none, well, well, I will move to um, our regular agenda items. Uh, just get myself organized to take notes at the same time. Uh, Um, oh, pardon me. What's going on? Apologize for the delay there. I was, um, apparently my laptop has also had a long day. Uh, uh, so our first item is to review the uh, Mandarin Immersion Program uh, and Spanish Dual Immersion Program recommendation to the board. Uh, in the agenda, a, um, uh, a link to the board item from um, the February 9th board meeting uh, is provided also a link to the immersion task force. Um, I uh, also uh, sent out some materials uh, to the committee that uh, to, to hopefully help guide us through this conversation as well, which I will pull up in a moment. But I first wanted to give staff the opportunity to um, to provide any introduction or, or updates. Sure, I actually, I'll defer to uh, Associate Superintendent Pfeiffer if she has any comments that she wanted to say first. Um, other than what was presented to uh, the Board of Trustees, uh, there was a presentation that uh, reflected all of the different activities that took place, the different meetings that took place and that the committee um, had a survey that was sent out to the different members of the, uh, the community and the, um, the different groups, the Mandarin students, the Spanish students, their families. And so the results are reflected on the agenda that, um, that is linked to your agenda. And at the next board meeting, which is on, March, on February 23rd, the board will be asked to make a decision. The recommendation is to, to basically unify uh, both, not both of them together, but we have several classrooms in different schools for the Spanish uh, immersion program and also other schools that hold the, the Mandarin program. So the unification is for each of the programs to be going to one location instead of them being spread out throughout the district. Um, so one of the schools that we're looking at for the Mandarin program is Lila Bringhurst. And I believe it's Blaco that we're looking at to unify the Spanish immersion program. And that's all I have. Yeah, thank you. I will... Um bring up the presentation that I shared. Um, let me share my screen. So. And if you, 
have a question. I uh, may not notice it as I have my screen shared, but um, uh, ho hopefully everybody is seeing the um, slide review MIP SDI recommendation. If one person could confirm. Yes. Yep. yep. Thank you. No, it's actually probably a better way for me to do this. Let me just try one one more option real quick here. I'm gonna have to practice with the technology here. Oops. All right, hopefully you're still, now hopefully you're seeing it again now. Yes, we are. Yes. Fantastic. The, um, and so, so the, I exerted the recommendations from the task force and um, in, in kind of my su suggestion for, um, uh, well, and then I, my proposal is to walk walk through um, these slides, and then we'll, we'll we'll kind of move to discussions and and questions and answers. Um, and it and yeah. So but let me let me just go ahead and walk through this, which is kind of re recap some of what Nancy sh shared. But also, we'll share some additional information that I thought would be useful for for the FAC to consider. Uh, and if, it, like I said, if there are questions, please please flag them along the way. Um, so anyway, obviously, the first thing the important point to point out is unification of the immersion programs. It, it was the recommendation from the task force, and even in our previous work as FAC, I think we we had endorsed unification of the programs as well in our in our recommendations for facility pri priorities. So. Very consistent there. And I suppose I should say the uh, the uh, well the the actual we'll be considering tonight is whether or not um, we want as as a body to uh, provide input to the board or or, um, or or perhaps even recommend an recommend an option. So that that is the goal tonight. Uh, we don't have to if you know if there, if there isn't an option that that uh, that we decide as a body to support, but um, so but keep that in mind as we're walking through this. Um, option A, and I guess this will be very important because uh, one of the questions uh, I will ask ask uh, us to consider is whether or not we're going to formally endorse one of these options. Um, and option A is to unify the MIP students at Lila Bringhurst and the SDI students at Blakeout. Uh, and option B is to unify the Mandarin Immersion Program students at Blakeout and uh, unify the Spanish Dual Immersion students at Grimmer. And I will go through this quickly, uh, just so we have plenty of time for discussion. But like I said, if you have questions now, please feel free to ask. Um, now, as I, as I was thinking about how best for us to discuss this as a, as a committee, I went back to the report on FUSD back goals and success criteria that we recommended, uh, where we had a, a rubric for considering uh, changes. And I thought this was a good thing for us to return to as we looked at this change. Um, the Mandarin Immersion Program and Spanish Dual Immersion Programs are definitely important instructional programs, but these are this is also a significant uh, uh, has, has significantly facilities considerations because uh, there are, are about 700 students in between these two programs that, you know, some number of them could be moving to other facilities. And so uh, having a rubric in mind, I thought was wise, uh, not only uh, to help help us with our discussion, but I think it's also good for us to test our rubric and how well it works and continue to iterate on it as a, as a tool for making and recommending facilities decisions. And as mentioned uh, earlier, we'll provide input and or recommendations to the board. This is our, our rubric, um, which uh, kind of set out six goals. Um, 
each of which we, we defined a measure for each goal and a weighting factor, which kind of, uh, Rob, you could think of also as, in, 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 in a sense, prioritizes the goals. Uh, maximizing the impact of the funds spent on facilities was our top goal. And, uh, you know, as measured by how well are we utilizing uh, our, our facilities? Uh, and then also looking at how much additional funding is required. Um, we said as a second priority, reducing the number of overloaded students. Um, third priority uh, was getting um, as close as possible to the board adopted target school sizes. Uh, fourth was looking at the socioeconomic composition uh, of any change to see if it had a material effect on things. And th there are not, uh, they're not easy measures for this, but uh, we thought a reasonable um, proxy to look at was the free and reduced lunch program. So, you know, how that would work in practice is that any major facilities change, we'd, we'd want as a consideration to look at, is it uh, dramatic, well, dramatically is maybe the wrong word, how is it changing uh, the proportion of free and reduced lunches at the schools impacted? Um, so, you know, for example, we wouldn't, uh, we do, is it um, adding a lot more students in the free and reduced lunch program at a school um, uh, and, or in make, making the, uh, um, uh, a bigger disparity between schools versus uh, less of a disparity between schools on that, on that measure. Uh, fifth is reducing the number of temporary portables. Uh, and sixth that actually uh, targeted for tar having targeting our locations for specialty programs, which is exactly this topic tonight. Um, and even we called out the immersion programs as an important uh, consideration. Um, and not just that having a central site for them, but that there is room for projected growth. Uh, for reference, we included the board adopted school size targets. Uh, I'll note that we recommended that this middle school size target be increased from 1,500 to 1,800 students. And that was to, because the, uh, the target was originally adopted at 1,500 back when we were junior highs, seventh and eighth grade only. And so, um, uh, or, or for it to be comparable to the, um, uh, the original junior high target, uh, uh, 1800 was um, a more comparable target compared to our previous junior high targets. Uh, so I tried to apply our rubric to this, this change and started looking at like um, um, uh, analyzing the impact of the immersion program options. And um, uh, it's a very complex data, uh, and I took several different views of the data. Um, and so I apologize, there's some, some, um, so, some of the tables are quite dense. Um, I tried to take, uh, or well, I did take all data from public data sources that I could find um, and from public documents. I did not get, have a, uh, the opportunity to fully verify uh, everything with staff. Um, and I'll make a, a, a remark, the, um, I, I mean, I think we and staff know all too well that um, students move around, enrollment changes. So, so the, the time at which, which uh, the public documents I found with data, um, you know, the number of students we have in the program now is probably different. And so I think um, uh, the, you know, we should be thinking about the, the data in terms of ranges and gen general, general trends um, and, uh, and maybe, uh, maybe we ask questions to zero in on parts of the data that we think need, need to be more looked at more critically because, it's, because, because the threat, you know, because uh, the, um, say the capacity is, is too tight, for example. Um, the, uh, so in looking at utilization rates, um, there, in the last, in the Schoolworks demographics report, uh, there are charts showing our current utilization rates using the uh, program capacities in that report. And so this helps you visualize that uh, in the 21, 22 year. And I had to put in the elementaries here. Uh, in the next slide though, I zoomed in on this particular area here. 
And I thought, well, this was definitely helpful for me to help visualize the location of all the sites involved in the recommendation, as well as their current utilization rates. Uh, and you can see I put the, the three sites that are being considered as unification sites, Blake Cow Grimmer and Lila Ringhurst in red boxes, and then Azaveda and Vallejo Mill in the, uh, the rounded um, dark orange or brown boxes. Um, and then next took a look at the enrollment projections. And this is reference data from the September uh, Emergent Task Force. Um, and again, I think, I, I think there are more current numbers that have been considered by staff and the board, but, but this should give us an idea. Um, and, um, and so 372 enrolled students in the SDI program, 418 enrolled students in the MIP program. And then I pulled the current enrollment um, and capacities from the School Works report, and I and I and the part I highlighted in red um, and and, um, and it is something we should come back to to, to verify because I think um, uh, while wow, the re report for Lila Bringhurst stated a capacity of 902 students, you know I think I've often heard that the capacity of that school uh, is higher than that. So we'll wanna uh, make sure we have that understood accurately. Uh, and in this chart, um, I thought it helpful to look out into future years. Um, and so you have the capacity, the 27-28 enrollment projection, and then just, you know, the space is just the enrollment minus the capacity. Um, and then I put um, the options um, A and B on a slide, and and I did a very simple adjustment. There is a I'm, there there are more complex considerations I know because because of the way uh, the programs work. But just to, to make it easy to look at a high level view, view of the data, the simple adjustment I did was to take um, the 27-28 uh, enrollment projection and, and I took the um, SDI and MIP program numbers, the 372 and the 418 numbers from the previous slides and just adjusted each of those schools by that amount. Again, in reality, it's probably different now because, uh, and, and this doesn't account for other things like um, uh, program strand sizes and um, uh, but to give us a high level idea of what of what the two options look like uh, yellow is option a um, uh, blue is option b and then uh, in both options a and b as a beta and Blair mill will be will have their enrollment decrease and so i thought it useful to take a look at at that as well Uh, this, um, I always remove this, but this is like all that data on one slide. So I won't, I won't spend a lot, a lot um, or, or actually, no, I, I apologize. This is, um, you know, basically the next couple of slides are to, to ha have things for us to refer to as we discuss, but this has the current enrollment, uh, and then the potential enrollment using that methodology I just described of, of simplistically, um, uh, applying the the uh, those September SDI and MIP uh, numbers, and this is everything on one slide for 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 people who really like data. Uh, so that was a lot, but please uh, I welcome um, questions at this time. I had one question. So um, being that, um, you know, new to the group and everything, and I, I don't know all the, the information that's out there. I was just curious, is, is the Mandarin immersion program leaving Azaveda because it's overcrowded over there? Or I drive by Azaveda and I, I noticed they have parents kind of with their signs and stuff wanting to keep it there. So I was just curious um, why it was leaving uh, 
being kind of late to the party here. <laughs> oh, no, don't hesitate to apologize. I, I went through the information quickly. So if we, uh, foundational questions like that are important. Yeah. So to to uh, to answer the question, I actually welcome staff if you'd like to uh, address that first. I'd be happy to, Brian. Um, actually, they are over. They are going to overgrow as Veda's capacity to actually handle the uh, four strands that they want to maintain. And the, the school would not have the ability to manage all four strands for the entire, you know, for the entire uh, K through five that they are requiring. And so that is why we had offered them an alternate site to actually split into a K three and then a four through five or um, look at totally different sites. And so that's why as VEDA is not a contender because based on homeschool enrollment and the growth that they would like to have for that program, it would not be able to accommodate um, what they're asking for. Okay, yeah, thank you. And they're already outgrowing as, as a VEDA. They're split now between as a VEDA and Blake Cup. That's my understanding. Um, also speaking from the teacher union side, the teachers at the SEI programs and MI program, they all basically what um, Kelly just mentioned, they just want the programs to be able to grow and uh, expand. So that's why they would like to move it to school where they have room to expand. So so for te the teachers there, they really want the uh, SDI program to move to Blake Cow and the management program move to Rankers so that there will be rooms for them to, to grow. But we'll love to be able to hear from the parents side on this also, but at least that's from the teacher side. And just so that you all know, one of the main considerations for, I don't know, do, do we have an SDI parent representative here? Um, part of their challenge was a same, similar to M MDI, Mandarin Immersion Program, MIP, I'm sorry, is that they wanted to maintain a sense of community as well as consolidate their, their learning environment to one area. And the transportation to Lila Bringhurst would pose a problem for them. And I believe in the surveys, it was stated that a lot of the parents in both programs, if they did go to Lila Bringhurst, would actually end up leaving the programs. And so that's part of the dilemma is how do we figure out how to satisfy everybody's needs with the limited resources that the district actually has. Uh, Michelle. Yeah, uh, Kelly, if I could just get a clarification. You said both MIP and SDI parents said that if either one of their programs moved to Lila Brinkhurst, there was going to be a drop. So I knew that was Spanish, but Mandarin, Mandarin also said that? There were several Mandarin parents as well. Just a follow-up question, uh, being that I do represent also our bus drivers, have is there any consideration of opening up bus transportation for these students going from the schools that they're currently at going to a new location? You know, I'll let Associate Superintendent Pfeiffer answer that, but I know that, you know, it does boil down to a budgetary issue and looking at how you know we can manage the resources that we do have. The um, the board one of the board members asked for the cost of us providing transportations um, to the different groups, and that information will be shared at the board meeting as far as the cost associated from us providing transportation. 
The other thing that I, I wanted to comment on, um, we had a, a very healthy group of parents attend the last board meeting. And in during that meeting, there were opinions of individuals who felt that the distance was not going to be an issue. It seemed like it was a, a greater number of parents that really wanted the, the unification. The, the teachers, at least the parent, the students that were there also wanted unification so they would have a larger group of students to, to work with. One of the things that were, com the comments that were made were that teachers would have more teachers to collaborate with versus being two or three classes in one location. So um, I know that the committee, similar to your committee, put in a lot of time and effort into meeting, reviewing uh, the facilities, reviewing all of these cases and preparing a survey. And I think that the recommendation from staff uh, speaks to the results of that survey. And I just wanna make sure that um, we also consider those facts as we're looking at uh, at the information for for our group now. Uh, that, thank you. That's that's a great summary. Um, I know uh, Sh Sharon Coco has attended the immersion task force as a liaison, uh, and I uh, didn't know if there was anything you wanted to add to the. Uh, discussion at this time or any additional com context or reflections? Um, the only um, thing that, and I'm not adding it, I'm kind of reiterating what uh, Associate Superintendent Pfeiffer said. There was um, extensive meetings that were held by the principals of the schools of the programs to meet with parents not only in the program but parents in the community of those schools to try to determine um, the want and the ask of those parents and students and teachers in the program. So the survey results really do speak to what, I'm not gonna say majority, but a, an overwhelming number of parents and teachers would like. Although I will say there are competing interests, there are parents who don't want to change the schools that their children attend. If they're in Azaveda in that program, that's the only school they've known. They consider it home. A lot of them are homeschool students. So it's a very um, personal issue. And this has been going on for so many years. And we're finally at a point to make a recommendation that I believe the board has good information and then now it's up to them to determine which way they would like this program to go. Unification, some parents want it to stay as it is at the, the um, different locations. They're not, they don't have a problem with that, but we're finally at a place where we have good data. Um, and so listening to parents on the committee, listening to staff on the committee, they've done their job to provide the information for the board to make the decision. So that's all I would add. Thank you, Sharon. So, um, so I think in our role, if I see it in advising, um, there are, are couple options on, on, on the table. And I think um, from, from the standpoint of, this may be oversimplifying it, but I think that what I'm thinking about is um, what is the best option that will allow the immersion programs to grow and flourish, right? I think that is a stated goal of the board, of the staff, parents, I think even, even in our report, we room for growth. We want those programs to flourish. So what is it, what, of the options, option A and B, um, what I'm thinking, which one will help the program flourish the most? The, uh, the other aspect is, you know, what, uh, are there other impacts um, to the schools um, that the programs are leaving that I think are, are worth, um, 
worth considering as well. And then, and then, as I said, I was testing this all within the framework of our rubric. Um, so those are kind of the principles I'm thinking about in terms of how to evaluate this. I, I wanted to first check in with the committee to see if there are other thoughts or principles or questions. So I think when Antonio was chair, one of the things he did that I thought was very, very wise was he would he'd encourage us, encourage someone to make a motion. Because once there's a motion on the table for an action we want to take as a committee, uh, that'll, that'll lead, lead to, to more discussion. Um, so is there anybody um, interested in making a, uh, a motion that for FAC to recommend one of the options be selected, for example. Uh, this is Robert. I recommend that we go with option A. We recommend option A to the board. Although I am curious, if you did work with the rubric, I'd be curious to know what your, your conclusion was. Uh, well, why don't I call for a second to your motion as soon as the motion and then we'll go, go to discussion and I'll happily share my perspective. Um, uh, I'll, I'll second the motion, Cecily Lee. All right, thank you, Cecily. All right, so the motion, it would be for a fact to um, recommend option A uh, be selected for the immersion programs. The um, let me pull up the slides again to sh share the rubric. I'll answer your question, Robert. Uh, having the rubric, this is option, I guess this is first off, this is option A. Um, and if I go to the rubric, when I, when I look at the rubric, um, You know, we're really this is kind of net neutral on facilities utilization. Um, and actually, this is a question I thought about. Um, uh, actually, a question for staff. I don't know if there are any costs to either option, um, like facilities costs related to them. Well, I, Brian, I'd like to answer that. There's always going to be facilities costs related to increase in use of the facility you know there goes to you you probably have to increase your staffing uh if a school that normally has three or four hundred students and only one custodian and they grow to full capacity they can't still just maintain one custodian they actually have to get more custodians get more teachers um their resources that are required to run the school increase so maybe their operating budget might be at you know a hundred thousand dollars and it might actually grow to over say two hundred and fifty thousand dollars based on use size and um, function of the school um, and then if you have your special day classes or um, enrichment programs they actually have a financial impact as well to the schools that are not always calculated and not always visible to um, to everyone so there are those things that all always go into the consideration of, of these decisions. And I see that Associate Superintendent Feischer has raised her hand. I, I just wanted to add uh, additional information. The reopening of Lila uh, Bringhurst has been in the plans for a while. And the decision has now been finalized to reopen that school. In the budget allocations that we have at first interim and continue in second interim, we have allocated the resources for the principal, we've allocated the resource for secretary, we've allocated the resources to ensure that we have custodial staff, librarian, everything that's needed. So that's to open the school, the base, 
Then we have the students that are coming from other schools, right? So when the students are moved to the new schools, teachers will follow. So we're going to be after Thursday, we're going to meet with, uh, we're going to meet and look at the students and the, the classrooms that are moving and, and we're preparing the staffing allocations that will show that move. So if one location loses 100 students, and of course, they don't all come in in sets of 25 or 30, but most of the teachers will be following those students, especially the immersion programs, because these are specialized credentials. So then we go to, okay, so how many students will be left in the schools that they're leaving and how many custodial staff we have. So our goal is to utilize the resources um, that we have and make sure the resources follow the students and the staff that they're serving. And in that model, we're looking at, uh, you know, minimizing the cost. The other thing for us is continuing to have a school uh, like Lila not open is also a costly proposition because you know without utilization of facilities they start getting worn down you if you don't maintain them um, we had such an experience with the school being closed for a year when we went to start utilizing the hvac units they had not been utilized for a year so then we were having trouble get them getting them up and running so having the school be open is a great thing having the students and all of the, 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 all the students that are Mandarin students um, in one location will help the teachers, will help the students. And it you also helps with this new school that it will continue as it continues to grow. Um, this school will have students there that are from the attendance area and students from the immersion program. So we'll have more, uh, more utilization of the school. And that's all oh, I wanted to add. No, thank you for that. That and and I like how you put it. The to as much as possible, the funds follow the students. And really, the the intent of the question is: Is there anything above and beyond that? And I was not aware of anything either. I, you know, um, but um, uh, so yeah. So this is net neutral on on how we're spending. It, to, to the degree possible on how we're spending, how we're spending funds and uh, how we're utilizing our facilities. Um, this um, doesn't affect our overload students. So that part of the rubric's not in place. When we look at the board adopted target school sizes, you know, you want to look at, are we, you know, are, um, are we creating more schools in or out of those adopted school sizes uh, is how I think about that. And um, and at the, at the elementary level, it's 450 to 900. Uh, and maybe, you know, um, one of my, I, I, one of my, uh, slides, I'll share one of my slides to share what, how I was thinking about that real quickly. Uh, and part of the reason I'm walking you guys through this is for you guys to challenge my thinking on this, but but if you look at the, uh, if we look today, current enrollment, um, uh, we have, you know, just, just grimmer that's below the board adopted target size and rough numbers, um, we would end up with Azaveda and Vallejo below the adopted school board sizes. So, if I'm thinking through this correctly, we are in effect, um, we will end up with one more school that's below the, the, the adopted target size. Um, but that's true of either option. So, um, and, and, and really, you know, this decision is not gonna solve our, our small school challenges. We, we, we have to really look at other um, other approaches to that. And I know, um, and this is my opinion, just me talking, I think uh, looking at boundaries is, is, an, is an element of that, where, where we can, where we can act. I think we can find some win-win solutions there where, uh, where we increase the size of, of smaller schools and also have more growth space for 
transitional kindergarten, full day kindergarten, immersion programs. So I think there actually are some win-win scenarios as much as people get nervous about uh, adjusting boundaries, rightly so, I understand that. But I think um, uh, if we wanna do what's best for our kids in the district, we, we will need to look at that. Uh, but this decision um, is, not, is not the one that's gonna help us with reducing the number of small schools. Um, I'm back to my handy rubric here for reference. And um, they don't have socioeconomic data, but I, I imagine it's, it's rel relatively uh, um, uh, modest impacts to, the, to these changes. Uh, this, this shouldn't impact our temporary portables more or less. And, uh, and without a doubt, this helps achieve one of our, our, what we'd stated was one of our top priorities was uh, space for the immersion programs. So a long-winded way of saying that based on our rubric, I think bo both the options are about the same. Um, and it's really other considerations that should, should factor in to um, what we recommend. Um, and speaking for myself, um, I think the, uh, the, uh, um, the potential for the program to be successful uh, I think it'd be more successful if it was in a more central location. And so that um, leaned me twice, slightly towards option B. Um, uh, because, well, here, I'll just share. It's part of the reason why I did this particular slide here. Where did I put it? Uh, here was to kind of zoom in and see, and maybe even this, maybe even this one better, where um, Blake Howe and Grimmer are here and Lila Bringhurst is here. So for the North Fremont, the programs will be closer. Um, so, so, okay, so that that is my analysis based on the rubric and again, my opinion and, and probably why I will, will be voting against the, the motion is I prefer option B because it's a more, more central lo location for the program. Do we have other discussion? Um, Brian, this is Sharon. Um, although ideally it would be great if there were a school site in central Fremont to house both of the programs. Um, we've not been able to determine that there is one without displacing homeschool students. Um, the board has never been inclined to even consider that. And I, I agree, I don't think they should. And based on the fact that option B gives them no room for growth, which really puts us right back where we started, trying to find a place to expand the program. So having determined all the data that we had, all the input we had, and that the programs can grow at Blaco and Lila Bringhurst, even though Lila is, you know, on one end of town, I really do think for the sake of the program going forward to be able to grow that's the only option we have at this time. Could someone elaborate, I mean, could someone from staff maybe elaborate on why there isn't room for growth oh, beyond the two strands? Okay, I'm reading that in the recommendation. Um, if you guys look back at the task force uh, meetings, there were some analyses that were done and looking at the path of growth for each strand and counting, you know, from K moving forward, um, the schools would reach their capacities um, pretty quickly if they had four full strands versus just the two that they currently house. And the other consideration that was looked at is that the immersion classes are relatively small. 
and so the goal is to combine them and make them into a full class. So one, you now are consolidating students to be able to, one, be in a larger classroom and be able to communicate with one another. But you also look at the cost of the instructor or, or having co-teachers in a classroom that would manage a larger group that would allow for more engagement and more activities. So those kinds of things were discussed. But when the numbers were crunched in terms of how many students would be in the programs at any given time, there was a, a point that was reached that they would max out and not be able to be accommodated in that particular site that they would have preferred. Because the, as Sharon said, your local residents and home-based school students are taking priority over all others because that is their assigned school. So, and that was a lot of discussion that, that we had in many of the meetings. And the conclusion was drawn that that, that is one of the strongest factors, but then also the, the availability of having specialized teachers available to come and, and accommodate the growth was also another challenge that they were discussing. So you could have these four strands, but if you don't have enough teachers to teach at all four strands, then, you know, it's kind of for naught, right? So, but, but I hope that answers your question. But what is the, um, I did watch those emergent task force meetings, but I did actually find that information difficult to follow, quite frankly. What is the um, number of a students in four strands then? We have, we have 418, say 418 ish students now. How many are in uh, in four strands for for MIP? I can actually bring that back to you all because I don't have that information right in front of me, but we did look at that and evaluate it. So I'd be happy to forward that to the group. Uh, unfortunately, the decision is next week, though. So. Um... I didn't realize that they had smaller classes, but my understanding was uh, four classrooms for grade level. No, the classes are not full. There's on average 13 to 15 students in those classes. And our, our FUSD standard, and please correct me if I'm misspeaking, I believe K through one is 24, uh, two and three are 26 and I or 28. And I believe uh, fourth, fifth, and sixth graders go all the way up to 30 or 32 students as considered a fully loaded class. So as you can see, when you're doing the math, that's grossly under enrolled, but you're still having to support the same course. I, I'm not sure that's accurate for the MIP program, but uh, uh, Ms. Viper. The the issue with having so many, um, to, to having the programs not be in the same location is that there's not enough students to fill uh, the class sizes. And so what happens is then you end up with combination classes. You end up with TK or you end up with first and second grade. And then when that happens, it's very difficult uh, for teachers to teach two grade levels plus as a foreign language in these settings. So um, this year, the reason why it was allowed to have these small classes is because we did have one-time uh, federal funding to, to pay for some of these teachers, but that funding goes away, we're spending it. And so we can't afford to have uh, class sizes of 13 or 14 students. And also we don't wanna have combination classes. So moving all the students that are Matter, Mandarin students into one location, then you can have greater class sizes of a single grade instead of combination classes. So the risk of staying separated is going to have potential impact on the, uh, on the class and on the learning that's going to take place if we have to make combination classes because of such small class sizes. And I, I just wanted to share the class 
I mean, we we load or we when I prepare the enrollment and staffing projections, our transition, our transitional kinder and kinder, uh, we load at 24, 24 students per teacher. First through third grade is 28 and fourth through sixth grade is 30. And that's all I wanted to comment on at this point. Um, thank you. I think my understanding was that we certainly did have small class sizes in the SDI program, but I didn't, uh, based on the numbers, and my understanding is that that wasn't true, the, the Mandarin Immersion Program. Um, other than the fact that these immersion programs are going to have smaller class sizes regardless, because as people leave the pro because it's a, a program you have to be in for the full six years, and you can't enter the program in fourth grade if you haven't been in it from the start. You know, there's going to be some nat natural um, shrinking of, um, of of the classes in the pro in the program, very likely. Um, but that, that's just the nature of that program. Um, uh, yeah, I, I definitely. I guess I would be interested to s to understand how many students are in four strands. Um, um, but, uh, but I think, yeah, if, I, if I'm the lone person interested in option, option B, we should, we should move forward. I agree. It would be nice to have numbers, but I, I guess I kind of trust the task force that spent many months on this and argued over numbers and they have information that I guess we currently don't have. So I, I think the real, so yes, so one, on one side, having option B, both immersion programs are centrally located. It's easier for everyone to get to, but task force also noted that there's no room for growth. And uh, I'm, for now, please my faith in that. But it would be nice to see the numbers. Okay. Well, we have a motion and a second to uh, recommend um, uh, option A to the board. Um, the, I guess I had one more discussion point, uh, um, but um, are, are there any impacts to Azaveda and Vallejo Mill? Uh, in the past, I've heard parental concerns that, you know, because their staffing's going down, like, like they may um, lose um, the specialty programs, right? They have, Azaveda has a bigger school, losing X number of students, you know, will re re reduce the, the number of sections they have for the specialty programs, you know, science, PE, uh, and computer lab, I think, are the main ones. But I think that that is one of the other considerations worth. May not change our vote at all, but I think that's an important consideration. I mean, like for example, right? We we may may want to recommend that there be some supplemental support to those schools that are losing so many students. Uh, Miss Pfeiffer. Yes, just, you know, adhering to the, um, the services following the students, I think is where um, we're, we're coming from. And of course, um, when possible, we would consider uh, the needs of students after the students have been moved. Remember that there's going to be some adjustments. Some of the students that are in the dual immersion program that may not uh, be able to or want to move to one of the other locations may just stay there and not be in a dual immersion program and stay and take our regular courses, right? So we don't know the true impacts until it happens. We don't know how many students are gonna stay in the schools they're in and not participate in the program. We don't know the total of students that are leaving, we know um, to the different locations. So I think that this first year is gonna be one a year that we can expect to make have to make adjustments both in the schools that in, in, in the schools that are losing students and in the schools that are receiving the students. So we're prepared to 
to look at both. We have a great um, director, uh, Dr. Rocha, in, uh, that's been working with this program for, for years now. We also have the director of elementary schools who's also going to be involved as part of the planning of the moves that are gonna take place. So as the needs come up and uh, we will be addressing them. We have to, these are all our students. Um, thank you for responding. Uh, oh, Robert. Um, just one minor point. I think also Grimmer is going to lose students because there are, yeah, there are three SDI schools and they're all, if they're all go to one, then two will lose students. Uh, oh, yes, yes, Grimmer. Oh, that's an error error in the presentation I, I shared with you guys that I didn't um, note that impact in my in my trip there too. Yeah, you're right. Um, a good conversation. Are there are there any other any other discussion points, or should we move to the vote? Uh, so then, um, since it's not likely to be a unanimous vote. I will ask everybody to raise their virtual hand this time to record record your vote um, as members of the committee. So all in favor of recommending to uh, well before I call it what what I what I will do unless there's further direction from FAC is I will I will send a note to the board and speak um, to the board on this item just you know re reflecting that. Um, you know, should this motion carry that uh, we su support the district moving forward with this option and and uh, as voted X, you know, X to Y. Uh, and so with that, uh, so if we're ready, please, uh, if you are in favor of uh, supporting the motion in option A, please raise your virtual hand now. So I have seven eyes. Please lower your hands. Uh, if you are not in favor of the motion, raise your hand now. One nay. And is there anybody, raise your hand if there's anybody abstaining. Okay. All right, M motion carries. I will um, let the Board of Education know. Thank you. Let's move on to our next item, uh, review staff facilities recommendation to the, to the board. Um, would, would staff like to, um, uh, you know, brief, briefly summarize? I'm more than happy to. So um, as members of the public, you most likely have heard from many of the community members who have brought to our attention uh, some of the deficiencies or the concerns they have at the at various of our school sites. And some of these concerns continue to come up, started in, I started in July and the concerns that you see on that list are concerns that have been brought up either during board meetings or other committee meetings, such as the budget, the budget advisory committee and, and such of other uh, committees where members of the community come and raise their concerns, especially to the board. So some of the topics, I'm gonna call them hot topics, um, have been roofing issues. Um, some of you may have heard there was a, a huge 
that there was some concerns about Meadows roofing. Um, the other concern we've been hearing on a regular basis at the board meetings is concerns about not enough shelters for our students to either eat or weather rain. Um, so that has been brought up multiple times. Um, we have one of our schools who, whose baseball net does not capture the balls. And um, there's instances where there's, there's concerns about these balls hitting individuals. So there's a liability issue for us. Um, there's some liability issues with the tack, uh, the, the field, the rubber track. So we've been hearing a lot about these concerns. They've been brought up through uh, board meetings and different committees. So we decided to put all these concerns into one list of, of items. And these items were brought to the board. One of the things that uh, we, we shared or Superintendent Kamek shared with uh, Mr. Gubhart, <laughs> I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing your name, <laughs> is that in order for conversation to take place with the public and our committees, the board needs to the board needs to see these these items. So if we bring them to the committee, the finance, the facilities advisory committee, before taking them to the board, and a member of the community says, you know, you know, what about this need, and the board doesn't know about it, that's not a good thing. So we expected once we took this item to the board that now that it's a public item that can be discussed that we can bring it to all of the committees involved, right? So um, the list that you see there is the list of things that have been brought up over and over and over again. Some of them have a lower cost estimate and some of them have a higher cost estimate. So the conversation for the board was, these are the things that we're hearing. Some of them could be considered low hanging fruit, smaller items that can can help us with some of the public relations. Um, and there's there's so much going on with COVID and so many so much stress added from COVID that these these things that may be tolerable in the past are not as tolerable now. Getting hit by a ball, your car getting struck by a ball, um, tripping and and having an ankle issue at our our tax stadium, so on and so forth. So now it's here with uh, the Facilities Advisory Committee to review, to look at, to comment on, and of course, develop recommendations to the board. Uh, the funding source that is being referenced in this, in this agenda item is a reimbursement from, uh, from applications submitted to the Office of Public School Construction of construction projects that have taken place some of the reimbursements are for projects that were uh, not measure E related, and some of them are for projects that are measure E related. So that's a brief introduction. Uh, more than happy to answer questions if you like. Um, and yes, I, I'm glad that it's come here. I'm glad that it's here for your discussion and input. Who knows more than the members of this facility advisory committee? Of what's happening what we wanted to is get the conversation going so we can so if possible we can start addressing some of these things some of these things are projects that could be taken care of during the summer and we're running out of time to get them done some of them require dsa approval most some of them don't so anyway i'm just i'm just very grateful that there's opportunity for discussion and input and then hopefully a recommendation Thank you, uh, Ms. Pfeiffer. So this important to reflect, this is the first time this group, this specific FAC and this, these specific staff have worked together on, um, on facilities recommendations. So um, I think part of the conversation is like, is how do we even do this? Um, but some of us were involved in other decisions and the, the previous work I shared was context. It doesn't mean we have to do it the way we did it before but I provided uh, as context uh, for all of us. And, um, and before going into the, the recommendation, I wanted to briefly share that context um, as well, because that may help guide us as we decide to like, um, you know, how, how do we evaluate these things, right? 
Uh, so let me oops, pull up that document I shared with you guys. Um, and so the, the la last time this happened, um, well, I shouldn't say the last, I, or the, the, the last major facilities implementation plan change was this changed on December 10th, 2019, when the board adopted an updated bond implementation plan. Actually, what we're talking about tonight is you know, things that these, these different projects are interrelated. We can talk about that more later, but um, I'm, I'm not necessarily implying uh, that this item is exactly the same as this bond implementation plan update, but I thought it was good context. The, um, uh, and this, this, kind of actually building Ms. Pfeiffer's uh, point, uh, this also started as a request from the board for FAC to make recommendations. Um, and and we did, it. this was a, a, a huge plan update and we spent uh, four meetings uh, on, uh, on coming up with a priority list um, and, uh, and a recommendation. And I think we can leverage some of that work again, because uh, I think the priorities may ring just as true now as they did then, or with some, some updates. Uh, and then it was presented to the board and, um, and then, um, there was a bunch of work staff did to prepare the, you know, the, the final cost, final new budgets and cost estimates that took a number of months, which is why you, you saw that the actual implementation plan wasn't fully adopted till December, 2019. Uh, we recommended in June. Um, so one thing, these facilities, things can take, uh, a lot of time and effort. But we know our needs are more urgent than that. So figuring out how we can move more quickly, I think, is an important part of our consideration. Um, and these are just selected slides from the materials, I, I uh, the links I shared with you. In this case, we have, um, uh, I think this was the final recommendation for the implementation plan update. These are all 2019 budgets, so the budgets are probably different now because escalation and costs have changed you know, dramatically in the last few years. But I think the important concept here is that the recommendation ended up um, creating, um, they had three groups of projects. Um, and this is in addition to the middle schools, which are already um, uh, ongoing committed projects. Um, and in, in, basically um, you know, requesting the board authorize the first group of projects to move forward. Um, and that at a later date, we would look at the other groups of projects if there was funding for them. Um, there were some additional projects also uh, noted like uh, updating IT scope, the Washington High School Theater, um, actually the Kennedy High School, if, no, it wasn't in this presentation, but in board direction was to pull forward the Kennedy High School. Um, from group two into group one. So there were, were some modifications made to this recommendation as well. Um, I don't remember why I included this one. Um, so, um, and this was just the, the, ne the next steps from that, that recommendation and the, uh, and the, the board decision that I, I brought forward for, that I just referenced. Um, and then I think an important, you know, so that that's how we did that. We can go into other parts of that process if we want to dig deeper into it. Um, and then then the question is, you know, where are our funds? And I did definitely, um, uh, Ms. Pfeiffer, uh, Mr. Gahan, feel free, free to add context to this. Um, but the the two biggest funding sources we talk about, of course, are uh, Measure E, and then the OPSC or Prop Fifty One. Uh, uh, money. And the Prop 51 money, as Ms. Pfeiffer shared, is this is state matching funds we get uh, for projects that have completed. And it can take years to get this funding because there's a long, a long line, you know, the, lots of school constructions happen. There's a limited amount of funding in Prop 51, and there's a long line to get funding. Um, these aren't the only two funding sources for facilities. We have developer fees, sale of site funds, deferred maintenance funding uh, as well, but these are the, the two biggest available funding sources. Uh, 
And then Measure E is part of our, our facilities bond passed in 2014. Uh, this is the Citizen Bond Oversight Committee gets a monthly report and, um, and I think the believe the board gets a, a version of this as well. And I thought this was a useful context. Um, first off for, for FAC to know that there is a detailed report with, uh, this is just the title page. There is a, a complete set of the projects, you know, what's funded, their status. Um, uh, staff and CBOC do a very good job uh, reviewing and looking at all bond related projects. Um, and it, this report was also convenient for me to point out um, uh, the current funding available. And then the red, and then the red, the red box, um, the, the upper red box, um, category zero are kind of the, uh, are, are, I guess I'll call it uncommitted funds, um, E rate, o, OPSC and program contingency. Um, and that's the measure E program contingency. And then um, uh, in the uh, uh, staff's facilities recommendation, they noted they're expecting to receive an additional 9.6 million in um, OPSC funds. And so I would, it was helpful um, to kind of, uh, to kind of see how much, how much funding we were talking about. And I'll pause for a moment if there's any clarifications or, uh, or, or hopefully I, I, I have pulled the correct numbers for this, but um, that, uh, that staff would like to add. No, I believe you summarized it very uh, succinct and correctly, uh, Brian. Thank you. Um, so that, I mean, that brings us to the staff's recommendation which I included in this presentation for us to um, easily view. Um, and I think we should move to, I guess should we should move to discussion and, and Q and A. One of the things that I also think is important for you all to understand is that, you know, the construction market right now, the pricing and the escalation and in inflation that we're experiencing is unlike we've ever seen in our industry before. And the school district, we've been um, very conservative in how we have budgeted for these projects, but no one saw kind of what happened at the end of 2021 and how the supply chain is now affecting our ability to execute a lot of the work. So one of the things that my office is working on, and I and unfortunately I don't have it ready for this meeting, is that we're actually doing a, a cost analysis to see what the impacts are right now for a lot of the costs that we've already identified for our current projects and what the potential shortfalls might be. And then also this list that we've put together of high priority items that really affect us in terms of how we are able to operate and function as an educational institution. So of course we can't do anything without roofs and HVAC and bathrooms and things like that. But I believe that we really need to have a true picture and you all should see the impacts that we're really facing. So I just want you guys to keep that in mind and know that this is this is not normal what we're experiencing and it's going to get worse before it gets better, but there's a light at the end of the tunnel if we just plan effectively and accordingly. Uh, Robert. Um, so I, I agree we have, uh, this is a, you know, it's a, it's a big problem. There's, we have a lot of needs in district and limited amount of funding and no matter where you look everywhere there's a problem and that's why parents and community and staff keep coming with new things you know new urgent problems um i you know one minor thing is that this is not the only bucket of money that we have we have an ongoing maintenance budget so not everything has to be fixed through measure e i i bring a measure uh, i'm uh, you know i guess i'm personally a little bit passionate about measure because e i did spend some time working on it um i am well we are, you know, my biggest concern is 
we need more, you know, Measure E is not going to be our last major bond. We need at least two or three more bonds. I'm concerned that we are falling short on Measure E. And maybe that's normal, but I would say that I worked on the previous bond, which was Measure B, 2002. And one of the problems we had with that bond is that a lot of people told us, hey, we, you know, we, you know, we don't know how to manage our money. There was a, Brian knows this much better than I do, but there was a previous bond that failed. And there are a lot of people worrying about why are we doing another bond? We don't know how to pass bonds or we're not going to do very well here. You know, and the previous bond had failed because the, the bond before that spent money in ways that they shouldn't have. So um, I, I think there are four bonds. One passed and we spent money that shouldn't have. Two failed because of that. And then for the third bond that I worked on in 2002, we worked very hard to, and that bond came in on budget. Everything got fixed. And yes, some of the projects were smaller, um, but I think we also had very good cost estimates. Um, and actually we came in on the budget so that we, we went further down the list. We, we cut the list at some point at 157 million, um, but we got another 10 million done um, by putting money back in. You know, The money that we saved were, were uh, implemented in more projects. So we could come out and say, look, we did what we said we, could, we would do. With Measure E, we're not doing that. Um, I looked at the list that Brian provided, we're $110 million short, and I think that number is low. Um, I was on the, the, the committee that uh, started this bond, and uh, from my understanding, and Brian and others can correct me, I think we eventually let go of those consultants and hired a new bunch because, for example, we didn't talk much about how much this stuff would cost. I think that, I mean, I don't, you know, it's not the current staff's problem, but people, I mean, they came in with great credentials. They showed us their... 20 school districts that they work with around California, but um, I think they didn't understand what our problems were and they grossly, they did not do enough research to figure out how much it would cost. You know, American high school's HVAC system came in way on their budget. You know, it, I think it ended up being three times as much and that just shouldn't happen. Uh, maybe some of it's unavoidable, um, but I am, you know, it's hard to go out to not, for another bond when you say, oh yeah, we, we didn't do this, we didn't do that. Mission High School's HVAC system. Uh, I'm uh, to um, to be clear. I'm, I'm a former Mission parent, uh, but Mission uh, there are three schools in Fremont that did not get their HVAC fixed. Um, American, uh, Mission, and Kennedy were the three that uh, have serious HVAC problems. Um, American and Kennedy were fixed. Mission wasn't. You know that's the way it is. Um, but then we shouldn't. Then we should be really careful about how we, you know, how are we going to fix that? Because um, missions HVAC system will probably cost twenty million dollars, and if and when it fails, because it's made, you know, the, the HVAC system is ancient and they're buying, you know, parts off eBay because you just can't repair it. Um, then what do we do? We're hoping, you know, um, that we will get another bond in time to fix that because there's no other way to fix it. Um, so I am. I really hope that we try to get as much of Measure E done as possible, and I'm glad this money came back. I understand why um, council has said we should not put it in the Measure E bucket, because if there is a true emergency that comes along, we need to spend the money in ways that were not intended by Measure E. Um, but otherwise, I hope that we can, you know, when we go after the next bond, I hope we have a good story for this bond. And putting 20, you know, if it's $20 million that came back, we can do, you know, 20% of the leftover projects. Thanks. Um, thank you, Robert. Uh, other uh, comments or questions? Robert, I apologize. Which school did you say that you were uh, in a previous parent of? I'm from the mission attendance area. So, and I don't expect to fix the mission. I'm just pointing out that there are some, you know, serious projects that need to be fixed. And if we spend money. So one, one thing that I really liked about these bonds is that at least we do have some restrictions. Um, we legally, we can all, we have, have identified areas of uh, places that we can fix and we, sh and that, you know, so you can't spend money on something that, I mean, these are big buckets. But still, there are other buckets that we cannot spend money on. Um, so that, um, because of that, we don't. We only we, I think we only need fifty six percent of the voters to pass it. Um, so it's a lower threat. It's easier to pass, um, get money. But then we also need to 
I, I like this. I mean, I personally just like to see, you know, if we're going to say we're going to do something, then I'd like to see us do that. And and the mission HVAC, I mean, we can't spend all 20 million on mission HVAC. So I'm, I'm just saying that uh, the fact that we can't do what we said, it, it's kind of painful. If I may, I think there are, I synthesize a few important points that resonated with me, Robert. Is that I think one is, is we have to keep the support of the community, you know, through outreach and whatnot. I think it's important to also remember that uh, voters approve the bond. Uh, not all vote, you know, and not all voters are parents. Um, so uh, I think that's that's important because. Um, we have had challenges in the past, uh, passing bonds, you're right. I think the other thing, your, your discussion of the emission HVAC is a good example of the trade-off, right? If we move forward with um, the recommended items on staff's lists, what, um, you know, what critical, you know, what needs won't be met, right? You can see in the last implementation plan update I just shared with you, there were groups of projects and it, there was a, a, a whole methodology to picking group one, two, and three, knowing and, and approving funding for group one, knowing that there potentially might not be funding for groups two and three. Um, and, and I think, I, I think that the, both those things are super, are, are, are very important as we, as we uh, prioritize our facilities needs. Um, Tom. Hey, Brian. Um, I'm currently filling in as a maintenance supervisor, and I've been there since uh, we had the big storms a couple months back. And uh, I know one priority right now is roofing. Um, we had a lot of issues with it, and the contractors we spoke with said if we don't repair and take care of the certain things that need to be done right now, that it'll be a bigger problem in the future. Okay. Well, but maybe, build, but maybe we're building on roofing. We should talk about the specific items and um, and any context context staff wants to um, to add. Um, I mean, and may, perhaps even similar to the discussion we had on MIP and SDI is if there's any um, uh, to get the conversation moving or or. There are there any projects we want to strongly recommend or, you know, just this, this is a little more open-ended discussion than the SDI MIP one, but, uh, but if, if there are um, places you want us to focus, projects you want us to focus on more so staff, maybe that's a good use of our time. I think that, that one of the things that happens is that um, we have community members that um, are active community members, right? And our schools exist when, within different communities, the mission community. And so when we have community members coming to us on a regular basis um, saying things like, my, um, there's a possibility that my car is going to get hit with one of these balls that flies over and we're looking at, at an expense of two to three hundred thousand dollars I know that it seems like a lot of money but I think it's it's a good it's a good effort to show the community especially if we have an interest in going out to another bond that we are listening that their comments are not going on deaf ears and that um, we're looking at addressing those concerns um, so that it's just, it goes in sequences. We hear it again, and then we don't hear it for very long. The issue with the, with the uh, shade structures, it's, it's a constant now at the board meetings. And so putting, setting money aside to address those things will also gain us some goodwill that we are listening. When, when, when you go out to a bond and you say to the parents of these schools, that have been coming to the board meeting saying we need shelters for our students, we need shelters for our students, and we don't respond to the shelters, you know, the shade structures. And then we go and say, hey, can you give us more money? They're going to say, mm, 
you know, we've been coming to you, we've been coming to the board, and you're not hearing what the needs are, the immediate needs of the students are. Um, we have the issue of the, of the uh, tax stadium. The tax stadium is where all of our students graduate from, all of our high schools, where all the major sports are played. It's sort of, uh, it's, it's, it's us, it's the district. And you walk on that stadium and you see, you know, it, it's, it's all five high schools coming to one location at one point in time or the other. So, so what I'm saying is that there's, there's the possibility of some, and I hate to use this term, but I can't think of any other term, long, uh, low hanging fruit, things that we can do that are not very expensive that can help us gain some of that goodwill from the community that have supported these bonds. And, and we're gonna be knocking at their doors to support future ones. And so one of the reasons why I put this list together with feedback from all involved is because that's, that's what we're hearing. And I don't wanna think that, oh, if you make a big fuss, you get what you want. But when, when it's happening for now one year and then another year, I think we need to we need to look at the low hanging fruit. What can we do that will get us that goodwill, um, so that we can start building in that momentum? You know, as we move forward through our projects, we're going to be getting close to completing some projects. So having community members come and be part of ribbon cuttings is also going to be helpful. So I'm just planting a seed um, for for you to consider items that are uh, that can address some of this community outbreak <laughs> or outreach that is happening and help us uh, accommodate some of those requests and then look at the bigger costly projects like you know the roofing do we need to look at roofing and do we need to reprioritize right are those numbers prioritized correctly how many do we need to address this summer how many do we address the following summer and so on and so forth. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I'm sorry. Um, and so just just food for thought, food for thought. And um, that's all I wanted to share with uh, the group at this moment. Thank you. Cecily. Yeah, so on these questions, is there like a time when you, maybe I missed it, is there like a time when you want feedback? It seems like it's difficult to really synthesize all the information tonight and give feedback aside from our own local sites where, um, anyways, maybe we just have personal feelings about what can be fixed, but it seems like something a little more systemic as a committee or as a subcommittee probably would be more appropriate need to look at. So, so when are you looking for feedback? just so I can be more clear. Oh, I think you're on mute. Some of the items that are on this list could be handled this summer. Not all of them, but some of them could be handled this summer. The longer we take in deciding which ones we wanna move forward, the less chance we will have of completing them during the summer. So while I don't expect a recommendation tonight, I, I, I wouldn't expect that uh, with the first time you seeing all this information that you can make a recommendation. I'm hoping that, I mean, the next board meeting is the 23rd. The agenda will be posted Friday. The board meeting after that is March 9th. So um, I don't know if that gives us enough time to have another meeting. What I would like to see from this meeting perhaps is a request for additional information that you may need. Kelly, were you trying to say something? I was going to say the next FAC meeting is on March 2nd, so we will have time to gather data and possibly reconvene to have discussion prior to the March 9th board meeting. So your recommendation to ask for more information and possibly review it and come back with something on that day would probably be most appropriate. So you said it's March, which date? March 9th? March 2nd is the next FAC. Yes. And then March 9th is the next board meeting. The, Did we the, have a motion yeah. to move these meetings, though, to the third Tuesday? I mean, yeah. I believe you guys Tuesday. meant to, you guys agreed to keep it the way that it is. Oh, sorry. It, okay. Yeah. Apparently, if that, yeah. This is the special meeting. So, so the, I think, well, 
I think that helps focus us that we should probably focus on looking at the recommendation and and any requests for additional information. Is, is this the time then to suggest maybe like a subcommittee um, to look at it so that when we come back together on March 2nd, there's maybe a little more focused data from. Oh, that's it. Yes, yes, this would be the time. Okay, so, I, I'd be happy to join before that. Okay, so, and I, uh, uh, um, just a, uh, so the scope of the subcommittee you're proposing, which would ultimately would be a motion, would be to um, review staff's recommendation and um, uh, request additional uh, information uh, for for fact to cons consider on March second, right? Yeah, Is that what so you intended, I, Cecily? Um, I guess I was. To some degree, maybe I'm off. I guess I was thinking maybe by March 2nd, they wanted more of like a recommendation for focused items so they could take it to the March 9th meeting. So maybe okay. I was thinking so, more of the committee to make recommendations to the general committee so that then those can be brought to the board on the 9th. But maybe that's too quick or I, I don't know exactly. Ah, so the specific list is um, another one. And, and it's not to say that we won't be talking about other other facilities things, but the the specific list of sharing my screen is is this list here um, that staff is recommending, and so so the specific ask of us is to be in a p position to um, you know to to provide oh. our input and, and 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 perhaps support uh, in our March second meeting for. Um, for this list of requests. So this is it. I guess I thought it was larger. Sorry. There's only the, I mean, there's just the six items. Correct. Oh, okay. Um, there, oh, okay. Then of, co of course there, there is a larger list of needs and, and there's the long range facilities master plan update and all these other pieces of the puzzle that, that we need to all work on as well. But this is a specific ask. Um, I see. I, I was misunderstanding. I thought, Okay, maybe a subcommittee is unnecessary then if it's not. Okay, um, yeah, yeah, that's fine. Uh, Henry. Oh, um, yeah, I was just going to mention what um, you just mentioned about the, uh, maybe one, one thing we can do is look at the long range facilities plan. Um, it's like the survey that we have done so far and see how important these items are. Um, I don't know if that's, a, but is there an update on the long range uh, facilities um, plan surveying uh, is that are there any updates on that yet? I mean, is there um, because I, I know that we've been asking teachers and see if they're they've been uh, getting uh, requests for survey they haven't yet. So we were given permission uh, about two weeks ago from uh, Superintendent Kamet to go ahead and start that process again. So they will be reaching back out to uh, the sites and beginning the process of gathering that data um, to be able to complete that that set of information. Okay, thank you. I just want to, yeah, uh, because I know that the at the, each site, the um, school uh, site council usually are the ones who would look at it first. And I think for many school sites, uh, they like at the ring they want to have one more meeting before the end of the year. So um, that might be something to look into, see if they need additional meetings or, um, sure. or have to wait until next, uh, next So it's my understanding that every school site with the exception of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, did the initial registration that was requested. But the thing that needs to be completed with the majority of them are the questionnaires that kind of dive into um, programming and how the facilities affect programming. And so that's where we're gonna be asking um, instructors and the principals to uh, spend, you know, maybe 20, 30 minutes, set aside time to, to finish that work. And then uh, we'll be able to have a much more intelligent conversation with you all in terms of the information that's been gathered and then look at planning. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think based on that information will be really important if we want to 
propose another bond so let the community knows how all these stuff that needs to be fixed um so yeah so having that information i think will really help our community so thank you uh, nancy yes um the what we're referring to is an update to the facilities master plan and that definitely mm -hmm. is the document we would need to have updated as we move forward with uh, the possibility of going out for another bond, right? Um, that information's not gonna be available to us until a later date. And these items that are in front of you, um, I hate to say this, but they have, there's a sense of urgency in them. Um, so if, we, if we're not making decisions before we can implement by this summer, then we would be looking at next summer because they have an impact on the school sites themselves. Um, so having said that, um, when we look at the list of six items, there's a cost associated with them now and um, maybe an exercise that could be possible is to look at all six of them and see the, if there's a priority. I mean, one of the directions that we are given to us was for the um, for this group to look at this list from a safety issue. I think the board president made it uh, evident to us that she wanted us to look at these items from a safety concern. And so we can use that lens. We can use the lens of the group that passed the bond, um, which most of you helped pass the bond and look to see if there's anything that we can recommend if there's something that you feel is too big to tackle by the March uh, 9th board meeting and have a recommendation by the second one, then we can take that piece and say, okay, we're gonna need another meeting to discuss just this piece for just, I'm just trying to give some, some ideas of how we can move through this um, for the well, group. Uh, well, let, let's, um... Let's get into. Let's look at the six items then, so we can get the questions out on the table. Uh, and thank you for those ideas. I think, um, yes, the the board wanted to prioritize, make sure health and safety items are considered quickly. Um, uh, and then another suggestion I'll make is a question I always ask myself: is you know, um, you know what two questions like why are why are we doing something and wh where do we draw the line so we kind of have a um uh, so, so 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 we're 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 aware of uh so we uh how do i put this like we don't want to approve one project and then all of a sudden find 50 other similar projects sh uh, sh show up um uh that are equal equally um uh valid so those are my just kind of two of my overarching um, thoughts as I look at this list. All right, so Robert. Just out of curiosity, do any of these projects fall within the original measure scope or are we going out of scope? And I just want to understand. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear the question totally. Um, are any of these projects fall under the measure E bucket scheme or are these separate projects? Is there so portions of the scope of work do fall under measure E, but because of the depth of the scope, some portions of the scope of work fall outside. So it's um, we're in the process of evaluating and trying to figure out how to kind of weigh everything. And, and as you all said, prioritize it. But where we have the ability to incorporate it into a Measure E project, we are looking at doing that so that we can utilize the funds. But in many instances, um, based on the description of the scope of work and how I just can say massive some of the work is, it, it falls outside. Thank you. So why don't we go item by item and identify um, any questions, any um, specific to that item um, with the time we have remaining. So for the, the tax stadium, um, and Ms. Pfeiffer gave us an overview of this one already, but are there any uh, additional uh, questions or information needed about this one? 
Uh, William. Thank you, Brian. Um, yeah, going back to what um, was previously mentioned, and I think, you know, I just want some little bit of clarification. The projects that were mentioned that could possibly be started before uh, the summer or around the, you know, the end of the school year, um, I'm assuming that this is one of the ones that would probably begin at the end of track season, which just began, would be completed before the beginning of the fall sports season, which predominantly would be football. Um, assuming it looks like the field and the track uh, would encompass the scope of this work, is that is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Okay, and this is something that, and you know, at least the sooner the better. I think you know, message received loud and clear about uh, looking to get approvals for this. Um, but assuming this was to be approved, um, and the contractor is signed, it looks like the work would begin right at the end of the school year, and would uh, confidence levels are pretty strong that this would be done before the fall season. Is that right? Correct. The, the, the good thing about this particular project that it does not, uh, I don't believe it requires a DSA approval because there's not really a structure unless, um, so that would, that would facilitate our ability to get it done uh, before it has a major impact on any of the student uh, activities that we want to minimize the impact for. And, and just do we know that the last time similar work like this was was performed at Tech? Tom, I, I today when we were at the negotiations with SEIU, didn't we hear something about a year when this was last done? So um, the first year, actually, the field has never been redone. Oh. Uh, I think it was put in in two thousand and four, I believe, and usually has a span of about a ten year ten year life span you know with the field and that's that's with one high school and since we have five high schools using it plus pe through washington it's it has gone down um we have had the track resurface twice during this time but nothing with the actual turf okay yeah, thank you thomas and that actually that answer encompasses exactly what i was looking for in terms of um you know really the, the, the for lack of a better phrase the shelf life um of the maintenance that's done on these fields um, or these surfaces and so, yeah, that uh, to me justifies it because I know it's it's out in the elements. It's not in a dome. It's heavily used because it's not just one school. It's multiple schools. And so, um, um, yeah, I, I can understand the justification for this work. And, you know, being a school district that's in the Silicon Valley and being that the major sports and events are are taking place in those in that location, it really speaks to the district, right? And so when we talk about our community and we talk about uh, passing bonds, this is something that, that reflects truly on, on the pride of our community and the resource that are being used to enhance our community. And um, at one point or another, every parent who has students in our district from kinder to high school is gonna end up setting foot when graduation takes place on that field and on that campus for graduation. Mm -hmm. And we want to portray that as a good experience for them as well. Yep. I'm in there quite a bit, um, supporting my daughter and her friends um, the past several months. So yeah, I, I drive by there every day, multiple times in the stadium a lot. So um, I can understand that, that sentiment. Should we move on to item two, the uh, roofs? I um, just, Good conversation. Just want to move us along uh, as quickly as uh, as we can. So, item two. This is the additional detail on item two, which was the specific roofs brought forward. Um, so, I suppose one question. You know, why? A couple of questions. Why these roofs? Are there other roofs uh, nearing uh, nearing failure? Are are to a couple of the. So Brian, First if I'm going to answer that, um, we sat down with Associate Superintendent Pfeiffer. So Kevin Arthur, myself, Nick Ampon, and um, one of our vendors who has been servicing our roofs for us, we sat down and evaluated and prioritized uh, projects based on their immediate need. And so that's why you have your, you know, let's pick our top 11 and these were what evolved from the discussion. And based on the reports that we had from Trimco of the actual condition of the roofs being, you know, very good, good, 
you know, acceptable poor or very poor or full replacement, it allowed us to then prioritize based on what you all see here. So everything that was very poor or full replacement they are your top five or six, and then six through 11 are your very poor moving into the realm of full replacement. So um, that's how we came up with this list. Would it be possible to share the report of all the roofs? Uh, um, sure. Kelly, Kelly, isn't this uh, information the reason why we see the estimated cost escalation for eight years is because these estimates, and I'm assuming the report was developed in 2014? Correct. And so that's why I said we had discussions because we have not had a full roof assessment done since that time. And so Kevin and his team are working on actually getting that done. But with the weather, you know, at the time that we were having these discussions in, you know, November and December, the inclement weather didn't allow us to actually have Trimco complete that for us. So they're in the process of doing that roofing analysis for us now to give us the real picture, fast forward 2022, you know, kind of what's actually going on. And we do have a couple roofs where, you know, we have some very dangerous situations where, you know, people's feet have gone through the roof or there's pieces of material that have fallen, you know, while people are doing repairs. So those kinds of situations we feel are dire enough that we need to take action and actually do the work that's required. Because once they're done, you know, we'll get another 20 years out of them. So it's not, it's not going to be money that's not well spent, but we have to be very aware that these are dire identified locations that we really do have to address. Otherwise, you know, we don't want to be in a situation where there's a disaster. Let me make sure I understand. I think the roofing the, the last full roofing condition report is from um 2014 or maybe shortly before that it was 2014 the and there are a few that were done in 2016 2017. the ones done in 2016 17 were also compared to the ones in 2014 and we're basing our assumptions based on that information as well as the actual site visits that we've gone to these various locations to see the physical condition right now. And so, as I said, Tremco is our current um, provider, service provider, and they are in the process of doing an analysis for us up to date. Is, the scope, is that scope of that analysis all schools or just a subset of schools and then uh, Go to. We've asked them to look at our priority list right now, but the goal is to have all district sites evaluated before the end of the school year. Uh, uh, Ms. Pfeiffer. Yes, um, I'd like to speak a little bit uh, to the process that we would be taking to uh, implement these roofing projects if resources are set aside for them. Um, there are a couple of companies, one that the districts work with, and another that uh, Ms. McMahon, uh, Ms. Lynch has worked with that, um, that will come and do the assessments for free and then with the intentions of them getting the work, right? And it's difficult for us to select a, person, a, a company, a vendor, and this is a lot of money at stake. So if resources are set aside for this project, we will be contracting somebody to work on what's called the scope of work for each of the roofs so that we can actually go out to bid and have as many people bid on these projects so that we get the best buck for, you know, we get the best results for our dollars. And so um, that's the process that we want to go through. Um, it's difficult to engage a somebody to do that type of work and develop the scope of work that we can then turn around and put it out in an RFP request for proposals and we can have all these roofing companies submit proposals, which is where we want to be, um, without having funds set aside for these projects. So instead of bringing one project at a time, Maddows or one or the other, I just want to make sure that uh, we're looking at addressing this on a global basis and not uh, one at a time. 
Um, and so that was the intent about putting a, a, a list together that we could look at. Uh, Robert. So I thought that all of Kennedy High School's projects were done because of their agreement with the developer. Or maybe roofing wasn't part of the project for measure. Is that the reason why it's on the list here? I'm not sure I'm, I'm familiar with the, um, the projects that you're referring to. I know that Kennedy had a lighting retrofit program, and I know that they had a um, swimming pool deck repair, but I'm not familiar with any other major um, repairs that were done. And the as far as the what? My understanding is that when, when we built the, when we had the agreement to, to have the developer build Lila Bringhurst, in exchange, the developer asked that we do all the modernization for Horner and Kennedy, um, to, because I think Lila Bringhurst reports into those and they wanted those schools to look good for Lila Bringhurst residents. And so that's one reason why the HVAC project that Kennedy was done was given a higher priority. Am I misunderstanding or misremembering all of this? I apologize because I'm I'm new kid on the block, so I'm not familiar with the history of some of these things that predate me. Um, but that there there was some work done at Kennedy, but the the scope of work in the Kennedy modernization right now is limited to uh, roof penetrations and roof repair where penetrations are made. And I believe there's only one building that's been identified for roof replacement, but of course Kennedy makes up many, many buildings. So that's why um, we also have put it on here because there are areas that are not included in the modernization program that we actually do need to address. So they were missed in the in the original when they scoped the workout. Well, you have to understand, you know, in 2014, that's that's almost 10 years ago. So if you're looking at a roof that's 10 years younger, you're you're not going to necessarily see the same things that you see when it's 10 years older. This this would have been the Kennedy project that was scoped as part of the December 2019 implementation plan update. So this is the recent allocation. I mean. Uh, I think I think this is a good question to come back with some more information on because uh, I, th I don't remember I thought it was a twenty million dollar allocation for Kennedy. Kennedy uh, so currently maybe... has uh, twenty five million dollars with a construction budget of twenty one million, and the remainder of the funds are for the soft costs associated with the project. So when you look at those budgets, you can't always assume that it's full construction. It's actually, um, you know, soft costs are included in that overall budget. Oh, that's fine. Maybe, maybe you can provide offline the scope of, of that work just for, sure. for, for context. No, I'd, I'd be happy to bring everything back to you all. Um, I think. Uh, so the third item listed here is the parking lot at Hirsch. So it's my understanding that there was never a identification of a need for the parking lot at Hirsch while Horner was under construction. It's my understanding when they expanded the play fields and modified the area directly adjacent to Hirsch, they eliminated uh, parking that Horner and Hirsch shared. So all of the parking now is in front of Horner and away from Hirsch. And so the principal has asked and pointed out to the um, design teams very late in the process that, hey, you know, we're losing 35 or 40 spaces. What accommodations are there for us? And so um, unfortunately, at the time that that was identified, Horner was at like 98% complete. So there was not an opportunity to use, utilize funds in the budget to accommodate that for for them at that location. So um, now it has become a, a need that um, we have to address in some way. Uh, the follow, I guess the follow-up questions I would have would be, um, 
you know, how health and safety related is this, given that it's one of the one of the lenses. Um, and then um, kind of, you know, equity across sites would be a consideration, right? Is um, uh, you know, are a bunch of other elementary schools going to say, well, what about my parking lot, right? Just making sure we have an assessment of that. Or is this really just like, really was just a mistake in the Horner project, putting it plainly? I am not uh, familiar enough with the history for me to have a response for that. But uh, from- yeah, you don't yeah, you don't, oh, don't no, need to respond I, now. I'm not, not going to try and answer it now, but I will bring back information for you all to evaluate. But those are relevant questions that I personally don't have an answer for because I, you know, it, the history behind it, I don't have all of the information. So I'd have to come back and give that to you all. Uh, Nancy. Uh, thank you. If um, my understanding is that uh, there was portables in a certain area of that in that school that were removed. There was no concrete or asphalt installed and their parking lot shrank. And, and I'm going to call to Tom to, to help me up with it, help me out with the history from what I understand from uh, Kevin Arthur, the director of, of uh, uh, maintenance operation and grounds. This issue with the parking lot is one of those that I, continue to say that keeps coming up every time we turn around there's there's this issue about that parking space and the and the safety concern is that there's no no lighting and there's no parking and so staff has to park further from the campus than they than most of our schools if not all of our schools and if they do work late and they're prepared and their work and their sports going on especially when the light, uh, the sunlight goes uh, goes away earlier in the day. Having no parking or very little parking for staff, and not having uh, adequate lighting and adequate uh, stormwater treatments is is definitely a concern. So there's 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 a lot to be said about uh, this particular project being um, a basic need, right? A basic need to be able to go to work and have a place to park that's close to where you're going to be teaching, um, that has the lighting for you to be able to come early in the morning, leave late and, and, and have that safety addressed. So do you have a little bit more history, Tom, about uh, whatever happened, why we don't have a larger uh, drop off and I, I do actually. Um, the front of Hirsch, if you guys are familiar with it, is is very small. There's a loop on the left hand side where the buses go in and drop off, and on the right hand side, there's a, a very limited staff parking lot. Um, just this year, I've actually met with the principal over there because of parents that bring their kids in the mornings uh, for kinder or for the earlier classes that come in. They kind of gather in the front of the staff parking lot and there's probably maybe only 12 maybe 16 at the most parking slots and as the teachers come in or staff comes in to park the parents are also in that area because there is nowhere else for them to kind of stay well until their kids can enter the school so they've been having issues with you know staff coming in and parents being in this area and it's and people walking in and out um the area that they're talking about adding the parking lot is it was Horner portables that were up against basically up against the property line of Hirsch when they removed those portables I thought I mean I'm, I'm not positive but I thought there was plans in the beginning of this to add a parking lot in this area according when talking to the principal about that um, instead it's just a basically an uncultivated area uh, where there's no lawn it's just you know weeds and and a fenced in area and so I just think that, you know, adding that parking lot in on the side would be better also not only just for drop off and pick up, but for students, students can't walk up to the school either. If they're coming from that right side, they would be walking right through the, 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 the student, I mean, the staff parking lot that's there right now. So adding it in on the right of it where she's saying, um, I think makes a big difference for safety of the students in the mornings and the parents. 
Uh, thank you. And then, then like at our, our March second meeting, I'd be curious to know, um, like I said, if there if there are we, any we, other we sites. We, we, the, we, uh, we didn't hear anything you said. I'm sorry, your internet, oh. or was it my internet that went down? No, oh, I think it. I think it was mine. Can you hear me now? Yes. So, uh, then just for March second, would be be good to know if if there are any other sites uh, with as severe parking issues as this, um, or if this is really a unique situation in the district. No, we actually have some of our older elementary schools that are uh, being impacted um, by growth and and just you know expansion and. Um, you know, re you have to remember the average age of most of the schools in Fremont is pushing 50 years old. And so those classrooms were designed in a different era for a different type of student. And so we have a lot of growing pains in a lot of different areas that um, parking is one, classroom size another. Um, so we're kind of dealing with this kind of things um, across the board because when also our local schools were were designed, you know, people didn't have a lot of cars, you know, and now we drive everywhere and the backup is, you know, oppressive sometimes in the morning for drop off, whereas a lot of people well, so, walk I mean, all the time. I mean, walk I mean, all the time. But, I mean, there, okay, there's a spectrum, right? There's a spectrum of parking lot quality. And, you know, in an ideal world, we would, we would know where every school falls, right? Some have better parking lots, others have really really poor parking lots and where do you draw the line, right? And that's, um, that's the intent behind that, behind that question. Because I think, I think for each, you know, as we're prioritizing facilities, as we go through the discussion, there's at least three categories of things I think about, right? Health and safety, uh, instructional program impact and equity across the district are like almost three questions I'm gonna ask for, for every project. Um, so I, I would like to suggest that Tom uh, assist us with preparing the information that's needed. And I think that the lens that you're suggesting is the appropriate lens is, um, you know, one of the major issues is the, the fact that we have no parking, 12, 16, even 16 parking spaces for staff is not, is not adequate. So I will ask Tom to help us look at all of the sites that we have and which of the sites are the ones that um, just have no parking. <laughs> and this site seems to be the issue, not that we need more parking because there's expansion. If we can accommodate a larger group of teachers versus what we have there, that would be one of the reasons why we would want to at least um, and I've been here again only seven months, but this particular school continues to be an issue. So I will ask Tom to help us um, collect that information for the second. Uh, thank you, Bill, or, or William, sorry. Uh, thank you, yes, I just wanted to make actually a statement then I have a question for, for Tom. Uh, one statement, I, I agree with you, Brian, I think you, know, you, you have the right sort of lens in terms of how we're looking at this with you know equity across campuses i think you know from the leadership perspective um not just from the the committees or the, or the board but also you know the front line the the, the principal of the administration i think that as we're looking at different campuses you're obviously going to have uh ones that kind of you know flow to the surface in terms of you know where the need is greatest and i think that you know if you do an evaluation across the board i mean you're, you're going to see where the need is greater on some campuses um, more so than others and so I, I think that that is an appropriate ask, and I think the question is, is legitimate. But um, my, my next question, uh, Thomas, look, looking at that campus, um, that lot you're referring to, um, to the right of the, the staff parking, it looks fenced off. Um, is that currently uh, district property as part of the campus? Uh, yes, it is. It actually was uh, part of Horner before they did the, uh, the demolition. Okay. That was, so, so, uh, those were portables on the... Uh, left-hand side of the office if you're looking at the old school so that it actually is part of the campus okay great so you're not anticipating any entitlement issues or anything like that good deal okay is it possible uh, for you to show us what you're looking at i can did you did you do google earth to show i, I just yeah, i just googled it so i can get a street view from the campus i see 
I guess I don't need to present. Um, and then the item four is the backstop at Irvington High School. This is and an item again that that uh, surfaced to the top and has been surfacing to the top. Um, I think for for quite some time. I may even say a couple years, if not longer. And I would have to ask Tom to 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 help me with that time frame. And it's one of those also that uh, if somebody's taking the time to send communications and emails to the board and to community members, there they will take the time when it's come for us to to look at pa potentially passing another bond to to be the ones to say, you know, you've never heard us. But that's one issue, right? The second issue is the safety. We've been very fortunate that these balls have not struck a car when it's driving or a person. And and just a just getting hit on the head with one of those balls is 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 quite a it would just be not a good thing. And the liability from that, the safety from that. Um, so um, as far as history, Tom, do you remember how long this has been going on and what many issues we've had with this? Um, initially, we attempted to put a, uh, a net um, that would not be as costly as this net. And the reason why the cost is, is approximately $300,000 is because for this net to work, it has to be over 18 feet in the 40s, 50 feet. And anything over 18 feet requires the Division of State Architects. So while it doesn't require, you know, this huge like a building and structural and all these other components that DSA looks at, if you're going to put a post that high near a school, it's going to require that they see how, di how deep the holes are going to be, where these posts are going to be mounted. So there's a huge safety concern there. And that's why DSA involved in this, why there's it's a little bit more costly to do it uh, the right way instead of trying to reduce the height, which at that point would be of no benefit to us. It really wouldn't solve the problem. Michelle. Yes, thank you. Um, the battery's dying, so I'll talk quick. Uh, being at Irvington, uh, it's not just cars that are going by. There are two childcare facilities that are directly behind this baseball field. Uh, that have made a lot of uh, uh, chatter about this. Although when they started their childcare, they, you know, the baseball field has been there for 60 some odd years. Uh, my concern is that no matter what you put up there, there's a, a vandalism of people that are constantly cutting our fences at Irvington to get in to utilize uh uh, the facilities, they're cutting into the dugouts and all that. Spending that kind of money um, may not, you know, we may be throwing uh, good money after bad uh, in, in thinking about something like that. So uh, I, I would, there's, I think we really need to scope out the whole situation. I'm not saying no, not do it, but I think we need to go in with our eyes wide open rather than just saying, oh, we, we, we're just looking at the one side of the DSA, uh, the, the size of the poles and all that type of stuff. We need to look at the feasibility of it. And, and we did have an architect come out and talk to mm -hmm. not just um, staff, but also the coaches. And uh, Kevin, our director of maintenance operation grounds was there. So um, I agree that we need to look at the at the entire scope and see what other things we can look at uh, to prevent this vandalism that is occurring. Um, my, When you mentioned children are right behind it, that totally, <laughs> um, I wasn't aware of that. So um, while there's a concern with vandalism there, the this, this net is looking at securing balls that are in the 30, 40 feet tall as they're flying over. So I'm hoping that um, this at least will solve, if, if not a, the entire problem they have with vandalism, definitely one that concerns um, students in childcare, yeah. 
Okay, so I mean, it sounds like we may need some, you know, uh, additional context in our in our next meeting on that one. Um, and then the uh, cricket uh, is item number five. Uh, my understanding from watching the board meeting is not only is it a community request, but that um, uh, that in part is brought up be because uh, the Hopkins project is gone going right now and it might be a good opportunity to do it during that project. Um, actually, maybe I'm misrepresenting that, but if... You're, you're asking for um, background information? Uh, yeah, just made, making sure I was representing that correctly. Yes, yes, uh, that is correct. Okay. Um, if there are no other questions on that one, uh, uh, Shay, Michelle. Oh no, hopefully, did we lose her? I'm sorry. Are, uh, are we only looking at one cricket field? Because on any Saturday or Sunday, you can drive up and down Fremont and see there are cricket games going on uh, multiple fields that uh, uh, is Fremont Unified, some with uh, permits and a lot without. Um, my understanding is that Fremont Unified does not have any, any cricket, uh, fields. They, they may be using fields that are not specific to cricket, but the, the, what's needed to be able to play the field, I mean, the sport is not located in any of our schools. And Tom, you raised your hand. Yeah, I did. I actually um, checked on Facilitron because I uh, I also saw the board being and it said that there wasn't enough uh, space for, you know, cricket in Fremont Unified. And there are nine use permits for current use permits for cricket at school sites. So they are using I don't have the exact school sites here with me, but I know that there's nine nine current ones. So Michelle's right. They They actually are at many of our sites and um, and nine of them have permits for it. And, and yes, um, what I was sharing with you is that none of the facilities is specific, specifically designed for cricket. Oh, and correct. No, they, they do have um, yeah. like portable pitches that they put out there and things like that. Okay. The number of, of community members that, that commented on that item was fairly considered. I think it was most of the individuals that were there. And I think that what they're looking for is for uh, not just something that's not designed for that, but something that's specifically with the mount and can be shared with other sports. But that's good information to have. Thank you. Uh, William. So for the cricket field, um, there was a comment uh, to the tune of, um, I guess we're waiting to obtain hard figures from the landscape contractor. Is that currently in the works? Can, can we expect to see something to consider within the next month or so? We had requested to see if it was a possibility to put a cricket field on at, at um, Hopkins. And there is a location where the mound can be placed without interfering with the soccer fields. Um, so there's two soccer fields next to each other and in the center is where you can put the mount, I believe is what it's called, for the players to be able to pitch the ball. Um, and so what we have is this: the set aside of $100,000, more so is because of the current condition of the field and the potential cost of bringing the field up to standards because of construction and, and, and not a lot of maintenance, right? Because there are no students there. So potential cost of, of that. So if we're looking for more specific numbers, I can certainly ask, um, but there's the cost of making sure that all, both soccer fields are up and running for the one mount. So the one mount is not necessarily what is expensive. It's getting the other fields back to their 
to and making sure that the sprinkler systems are working, that there's water to the fields. So that's why the set aside was made of a hundred thousand dollars, could be less. Okay, thank you, uh, Jennifer. Jennifer Parker. Yes, um, I was just going to ask: Would would the um, cricket field um, improvement project would that be um, expected to maybe generate more funds through rentals? Maybe more more um, more people would be wanting to rent these facilities with those improvements being made. Is that does that play any part in that project being on this list? I think it's one of the benefits of making that improvement. Um, that yes, that would be the case. That then, then those those funds, those funds actually go back to the school. A percentage of the money that's collected for the rental of their facilities goes back to the schools. Um, I believe in prior years this has been up to fifty percent of the resources that come in, and so then the principal has the discretion of what to use the money for, and the other fifty percent is used to maintain the fields so that they're in in good shape for for utilization. So that that definitely is is a benefit from doing that. But I think I think the reason why it's on this list is because of the community's re request to formalize the sport and have a formalized place for students to go and and play. Um, Thank you, Michelle. Michelle. Yes, um, I understand that the community is requesting this of of the school district. To me, it seems like the community should be uh, requesting this of, of, of a city rather than a school district, being that we don't seem to have a cricket program. If we get a cricket field, then that seems to me would be additional costs um, of uh, looking at uh, incorporating that into our curriculum. And if we only have it at one field, then it becomes an equity issue. Uh, in a lot, I remember a lot of the discussion with just trying to get a lacrosse team for, um, for one school, uh, they debated on the equity there of how they were gonna allow people uh, to do those type of things. So I think when you're just dealing with, with one thing, this seems to be taking one, it's definitely not in the scope of, uh, of health and safety, but it's also taking it out of the scope, I think, of dealing as a school curriculum and, and more of uh, just uh, 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 trying to placate a, 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 a political situation and maybe have some direction. Uh, we also have uh, things that are coming up with uh, that we've talked about with uh, properties that are um, uh, city and uh, school district combined, that maybe it should be pointed to that area, that it's not so much the school district. That's my two cents. Thank you, Michelle. Um, so the, the last item on the list is the covered shades. Um, and I'd love to get uh, more background on this item. The dollar amount that that's been that we're setting aside two million dollars does not solve um, all of the requests that we have for uh, permanent shelters, DSA approved shelters. Um, um, it does not. If we were to install as many as have been requested, we would need probably um, ten to fifteen million dollars to be able to accommodate all of those requests. So well, maybe, maybe you start with, with what the core problem is. I'll, I'll ask a naive question, right? That's, a lot of our schools have been ar around, around for, for years and, you know, people have managed to make things work by and large, maybe not perfectly. Is there something different that's happened that suddenly this is becoming a priority? Um, yes, at Horner, um, when that school was, the, the school prior to being torn down and rebuilt had um, shade structures for the students to be able to use and dine and, and just protect themselves from inclement weather, rain, and so on and so forth. And my understanding is that um, when the school was demolished, so with the shelter structures, but they were never replaced. So you have a community of students that have one experience 
and then uh, you tear down a school to make it better and look beautiful, and they did. Um, but the, the shade structures, the permanent shade structures were never placed back. Um, the other school that that is uh, that we get parents to the board meetings on a regular basis is um, American High School. They have no, um, and I think that's one of our largest schools. Horner's also one of our largest schools. And the other two schools are Warwick and Wybell that uh, we are hearing from the the community, the parents, that they'd like to see uh, more shelters. Uh, Cecily. Yeah, um, what about like a list of schools that we're gonna get their shade structures installed? Like my elementary school, we were supposed to be top of the list. And as far as I know, there's been nothing installed that I saw today. Like, is this separate from that? Or are these people like jumping the line in that? I have not seen a list of priorities for shade structures. And I just started in July. Um, Kelly, have you seen a list of requests for shade specific? I, I, I remember- I have actually, I've actually only received two and Kevin and I reviewed those and there are some challenges with what was requested based on size as well as the type of structure. And so uh, prior to Eric Chu leaving, he was investigating what the options were for several of the school sites that had asked. And so um, we are in the process of picking that process back up to address those that. needs. But um, the challenge with the ones that were requested is that one, the size would trigger a DSA review and compliance requirement. And then the cost was cost prohibitive because a lot of the schools are like, oh, we'll just buy it ourselves. But then when we did a full cost analysis and presented it to them, they were like, wow, we can't afford this. This is like, you know, $50,000 is a drop in the bucket when you have, you know, a 40 by 50 structure that potentially will cost you, you know, $400,000 when it's all said and done. So those are the kinds of things that we've kind of been dealing with. But, um, we are in the process of, of evaluating those lists again. And these temporary structures, the way that we have accounted for them is that you know all schools will get something and it's based on their enrollment in size, so. Um, maybe I'll just email you then Ke Kelly later to see about my specific school. I guess with this, if there's schools that sort of have been in line and requested and you guys were looking into, my preference would be to go with what's been long standing versus what's what's new or what's recently showing up at school boards. Just my viewpoint. I'll briefly remind the, the the other I'll briefly remind the other consideration is, you know, should we be allocating money to shade you know, the shade structures, roofs, there's all these other needs too. So so I think um, too, one, can I can I just kind of finish that? So one of the things that um, the challenges that the schools are facing, and I kind of alluded to this before, you have structures that are old that are not designed for the size students that we have. So you have schools that have lunch rooms that potentially can only fit one class in. So you have the rest of the classes that eat outside, or they eat they're eating outside and they have no covering for sun, wind, rain, or whatever's blowing in the wind. So it is a very serious problem. It's one that has been coming for a long time. And unfortunately, um, because we are in a drought and we've had these excessive heat spells, as well as torrential rains, we really do need to provide some shelter for our students, even if it is outside, that they are protected from the elements when they're on the campus. And so that's where from my perspective as a facilities director, we're looking at how we're supporting the programming and instruction at the site, as well as maintaining safety. And this one falls into that sort of category of buckets that we really do need to have something that is available. And granted, it can't be permanent at this moment, but we're working towards it. Uh, oh, William, and then 
I, I will keep it brief. Thank you. Um, so first, I want to state that I, I don't at all sort of uh, minimize, I think, the need for this. I think I, I can see it and it's apparent. Um, I think my only clarifying question that I wanted to to bring up, and you know, Kelly, you might know this, um, and it's, it's okay if you don't, um, is that, you know, in, in the narrative, it indicates that there's, you know, obviously it looks like a, a short-term solution um, is what we're looking to implement um, to the tune of, you know, up to $2 million. However, the, the indication that it won't address DSA approved shelters at all the schools, that's noted. However, are DSA approved shelters part of a longer term uh, plan of what, what we're looking to implement? So in other words, it's something different that stands alone from what we're doing now. And so what I don't want to happen is we do something now, it has an immediate need and a solution, but then later on, there are gonna be requirements that are gonna indicate we have to tear something down and redo it anyway. Um, is, is that a concern at all? That is one of our concerns, and the structures that we've identified are temporary structures, but they're portable structures. So it's not something that will be, you know, kind of thrown up in like a lean-to. These are actual, um, you know, fabric, steel structures that we can, when the school year ends and nobody's there, we can take them down and store them. And then we put them back up and they can stay off, you know, up throughout the week. So it, it's not something that is, um, it's temporary, but it's not semi-permanent, if that sure. makes sense to you. Yes, yes it is. And the goal is to have the long-term DSA approved standing structures because uh, one of the things that DSA is requiring us to do when it's beyond a 20 by 10 or 20 by 15 shade structure, the fire code as well as the structural code require us to do additional anchoring and bracing and we actually have to put sprinkler systems in those things and that's where our added expense is coming in because it now becomes this freestanding structure which we know that it really isn't but they're looking at it from the perspective that hey this is a public facility and we have to adhere to these standards so that's kind of what we need to educate the public on in understanding that these are not just these really simple things you pop up in your backyard, these are actual, you know, structures that have to withstand sure. an earthquake, so. Okay, thank you. Um, Nancy. Um, yes, I, I just wanted to make sure that, so the, the cost for the temporary structures that we're looking at buying is approximately $350,000, $360,000. That's, that's the first that's the portable ones to get installed. Um, the second option, and we're looking at temporary as well, is to rent a few of them for a few months. But the, the ask uh, from to set aside $2 million is to have the resources to put some permanent structures through the DSA process. So we would be working towards, so so if it takes us three months, four months to get permanent structure. So the funding source that we're asking for is for two permanent structures at 10 of our schools, a total designated amount is a $200,000. There hasn't been a ranking yet of which schools would get what, but again, the first, the first is to rent the, um, the, the, I call them tarps, but these are, when you go to a, a large wedding, they have these white tents out there, uh, similar to that. So we would rent a few until we can go through the formal process. We cannot spend $300,000 without going through an RFP process. A purchase over $94,000, $95,000 requires that process. That process can take two to three months. You have to post it in the newspaper. You have to get bids. You know, there's, there's a whole process that you have to go through, getting it to the board, allocating the resources. And then at the same time, we're trying to get uh, permanent structures, uh, which would have DSA approval at uh, some of our school sites. So we're, we're looking at three potential ways of addressing this concern so we can address as many as we can. Thank you. Well, I want to thank everybody. Um, I think if there are any other requests for information you have, um, please send them to me and Kelly to not communicate with the whole FAC, but if there's anything else you'd like us to try and information you'd like us to try and get for uh, March 2nd, let, let, uh, let me know. 
And uh, this was a good good conversation. Thank you, everybody, for, for uh, sticking with it. This is the first time we've done this, so I know I've learned a lot, not just about the facilities, but also um, uh, uh, I've got to do, to do some thinking about how we, how we handle reviewing these things as well. Uh, and uh, Ms. Ms. Pfeiffer. Just one last thing. If you could please include me in the list of things that are needed oh, yeah. so I can allocate resources to make sure that we have the information, hopefully before that, so that you can have an opportunity to review it. And Kelly's plate is so big and so loaded with construction and facilities that I'd like to be able to allocate other resources from our purchasing department to look at cause to our maintenance and, and grounds to look at options and definitely from Kelly to um, any additional resources that you may need. So please, please send me that list and then we can coordinate who's going to take care of it so we can get it back to the committee as quickly as possible. Yeah, thank you. We, we do appreciate it. Um, our next meeting is March 2nd uh, at 7.30. Uh, again, thank you again, everybody. Um, unless there, uh, Jennifer. Just a quick question. So like for homework, are we, are we deciding at the March 2nd meeting, like are we prioritizing that list of one through six or are we saying um, some things, are we taking anything off the list or, or what, what is the, mm. the goal between now and March 2nd? So, um, so staff's goal is to try and get something to the board on their March 9th meeting um, to, to approve. Um, and some of the projects I'm sure are time critical that they want to do during the summer. Um, and on our March 2nd meeting, um, we, we would like to, to get to a point where um, we, we, either we, we, we provide input or like we did earlier, we we formally uh, endorse a recommendation. Oh, and then um, as a group, we will just say yay or nay to one through six, or are they all going and we're prioritizing one through six? I, th I think, oh, go ahead, please, just, please. Just to, just to uh, I mean, what I'm, what I'm hoping will happen is um, that there is a ranking of, okay based on the guidelines that we have huh. of safety and um, and all the things that Brian spoke about. Right. And based on those guidelines, prioritize, right? Oh. And um, bring the prioritization to the board of these items. And what you would, once you have the ranking, then the board can decide one, how, many, how much of the resources to allocate and how far down of the ranking they're willing to go. So I don't know if that's been the role before or is that something mm -hmm. that, that you're looking at. Um, the board wants to hear from this committee what their feedback is and providing a ranking of the items and even something to say, we don't believe that this particular, for example, the roofing is such a big project that you can also say at this point in time, we're going to ask that we extend the the research that we need to do on the roofing so we can we would come back for a different i just i just want to get us to to a recommendation of of here is the priorities that we have and this is one or two that we think needs to be moved to another meeting because there's more information that's needed okay sounds good i, I hope that helps yes oh no no yes yes that's an excellent clarification so there's a, there's a spectrum of ways of approaching this. So, um, yes. Um, yes, and I, I look forward to working with staff to to, to plan that, that conversation for the second. Um, thank, thank you again, everybody. Um, and um, I will look forward to seeing you all on March 2nd. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Have a good night. Good night.